Hey, hi, friends. Hey, this is Brother Mike back on the podcast. It's Sunday morning. Got a little late start today. I started at 9.30 instead of 9, 9 o'clock, and I apologize for that. I was on a deliverance call earlier, and I couldn't uh, couldn't finish up the deliverance in time. But anyway, Happy New Year to you. Amazing. It's 2023. Imagine that. That's crazy. That was a fast year, wasn't it? It was a crazy year, too. Everything going wild out there. Something else. Anyway, uh, you can contact me at mike at hardcorechristianity.com. You can also go to the website, hardcorechristianity.com. And um, remember, we have two uh, uh, deliverance services every week that are on Zoom. Send me an email and I'll get you the ID code and the password. Tuesday and Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. We also have two live services every week. That's at uh, 7 p.m. Mountain Time on Thursday nights and Friday nights at the uh, Deliverance Center in Phoenix. We're downtown on 15th Avenue, just south of Osborne Road. It's a red brick building. We also have uh, a healing and deliverance service after both teachings on Thursday and Friday night. Uh, 2023 would be an interesting year for me. I'll be teaching at the uh, Dream Center in. Uh, Central Phoenix, it's on uh, Grand Avenue. It's a men's rehabilitation center. I'll be teaching there on Tuesdays, every every Tuesday at 1230. And um, also Peter Valenzuela will be teaching there as well at the Dream Center on Tuesdays at 1230. We'll be alternating. And by the way, uh, Brother Peter, you can catch him on Facebook, Peter Valenzuela. He just written a new book on deliverance. And it's fantastic. I wrote a little foreword for it. And uh, if you contact him directly, or you can catch him on Tuesday night on our Zoom deliverance service, recommend you get a copy of that book. It is fantastic. He also has an ebook of it. And uh, it's impressive and uh, you won't regret it. Definitely recommend it. 2023 has got to be a different kind of year for you because you can't do 2022 again. 2022 didn't work out very well. And 2023 is going to be a boomer for you. And I can prove it. Check this out. If you go to John chapter 11 with me, you'll find a, a remarkable story. It says, now a certain man was sick. His name was Lazarus. If he, was, he lived in Bethany, it says. And uh, Mary and her sister, Martha, lived with him. And it says, it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was sick. Uh, Jesus had three anointings, so don't get that mixed up with the other anointing that occurred in Simon the leper's house. But uh, he was also anointed by Mary in Mary and Martha's house. And, uh, of course, Jesus had to be anointed for his burial was the purpose of it before he was to sacrifice his life on the cross of Calvary and literally save ours. And it goes, verse 3, check it out. Therefore, his sisters sent to him, to Jesus, and they said, uh, Behold, he whom you love is sick. Lazarus and Jesus uh, were best of friends. The Greek word for love there is not the regular Greek word agape. It is the Greek word phileo. Phileo means to be fond of someone or to like someone. Okay, There's a difference between loving and liking, right? Love and like are different. For example, a mother uh, loves all of her kids, but she likes one child better than she likes another child and so on, liking someone is different than loving them, as everybody knows. Some people you like, but you don't actually love them. Some people you love, but you don't particularly like them. Well, in this instance, it says here, Jesus liked Lazarus, and probably what happened was they uh, grew up together in Nazareth, you know, best of friends, Buddies, they did everything together, went to the synagogue, played together, sports, different things. They grew up best of friends. And uh, 
Lazarus moved, got married. He ended up in Bethany. Jesus, uh, as you know, left Nazareth and went into full-time ministry, a ministry no one will ever forget and no one will ever match or equal, that's for sure. And uh, Lazarus, hey, they had visited each other over the years. Jesus probably had stayed at their house during his traveling evangelistic ministry. And uh, he liked him. And Lazarus liked him. You know, the Greek word agape is used for the relationship between Jesus and John, the apostle. That was the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. So Lazarus was probably his best friend, be my guess. And it says here, when Jesus heard that uh, his sickness, he said this. He said, this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God. So the son of God might be glorified as well, is what it says. That's verse four. Now, as you know, Jesus was divine and you had God, the son, God, the father, and God, the Holy Ghost, the divine Trinity. The Greek word is theotis, or in the King James Bible, the Trinity is translated as the word Godhead. So you've got Jesus as divine, the Father's divine, and so is the Holy Ghost, according to the scriptures. Jesus said this sickness is not, not unto death. Right? Now, what he's talking about there is a permanent death. Okay, Because the Holy Spirit had reminded him that Lazarus was to be resurrected. And then in verse 5, it says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Okay, now the Greek word for love there is agape. So you can see here, Jesus both loved and liked Lazarus, both. That's neat, isn't it? You find somebody you love and you like as well. Boy, that's a, that's a great relationship. And it says Jesus also loved Martha and her sister, Mary. So the whole family and uh, Jesus growing up probably in Nazareth, they were all good friends. They all loved each other and they all liked each other would be my guess. And it says, when Jesus heard Lazarus was sick, it says he remained two days in the same place where he was. Then after that, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea. And uh, those two days that Jesus was waiting there is you and me. We become the disciples there. They're all sitting around going, why aren't we going to Bethany? What is happening here? Uh, Jesus's best friend is sick. and you can heal him. Why didn't we leave two days ago? Why didn't we leave yesterday? What's going on here? And there we are again in 2022, sitting there going, why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't he fix something? Uh, translation, um, as they say in Asia, something wrong. Well, something was wrong. And the disciples couldn't understand what was happening. They would have thought he would have left immediately on a rush basis, like an ambulance, to save Lazarus from dying. And that's what's going to happen to us. And if we can pick up these truths from this incredible story, we're going to have a great 2023. There are times in your life where God doesn't answer your prayers right away. And it's not because he forgot or he couldn't hear you. He heard exactly what you said. He knows everything about what you said and what you need. But he's not answering the prayer for a specific reason. Okay, Many prayers are answered, but the answer is delayed. And many times those answers are delayed for a specific reason, one of being 
How much faith do you have to hold on before the answer arrives? You know, the old story in the Old Testament of the great prophet Daniel, he hung on and prayed for three weeks before his prayer was answered. In that particular case, his prayer was being blocked by entities in the spirit world that Daniel was unaware of. He didn't know his prayer had been answered. And the angel said to him, hey, the first moment you started praying, hey, your prayer was answered. God said, go, take him the answer. And Satan and fallen angels and demons ganged up on this angel of God and they delayed him. And the delay was so bad that reinforcements had to be sent in. And you know the rest of the story. After the reinforcements were sent in, then the angel of God reached Daniel after three weeks. Well, I want you to know something. In 2023, that's going to be an issue with all of us. God is not going to answer your prayer right away, even though he heard the prayer and even though he said yes. Sometimes God says yes, but the answer is delayed. He either delays it for a specific reason or Satan and demons block the prayer's answer or the person blocks their own answer to prayer because they're living in some type of sin, doubt, or unbelief. What's required here? When you pray and you don't get an immediate answer to your prayer, you've got to troubleshoot it. You've got to troubleshoot the issue. That's what has to happen. And if you troubleshoot it, you'll always find that God heard your prayer and help is on the way. Verse eight, his disciples said to Jesus, master, the Greek, the Greek word there was rabbi. A rabbi is uh, the Greek word for rabbi. They said to him, rabbi, the Jews of late, wanted to stone you, and you're going back there? Now, this is the second time the disciples were confused. Uh, they couldn't figure out why he didn't leave right away to go save his friend. Why? What are you hanging around here two days for? Now they can't understand why he's going. They may have originally thought, oh, I don't think he went to save Lazarus because he just wanted to get stoned. He's afraid. But that's not the case, is it? No. Now, they thought he was staying there because he was afraid that he was going to get stoned. Then Jesus finally clarifies the whole thing after two or three days. Check it out. Verse 9. Jesus says, aren't there 12 hours in a day? If any man walks in the day, he won't stumble because he can see the light. And he called himself in this verse, the light of this world. The Greek word for world there is cosmos. It means humanity, the human world. Then Jesus said, if a man walks in the night, he stumbles because there's no light in him. Wow. What's he talking about there? It's all spiritually symbolic. You can see that clearly. Verse 11 says, these things he said, after he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Well, the Holy Ghost had told Jesus that Lazarus was dead and that he was to go resurrect him. And Jesus already knew what he was going to do. But he didn't tell the disciples because he was trying to use it as a training exercise. And that's what's going to happen to you and I sometimes in 2023. Some of our prayers are going to get answered immediately. And other prayers are going to be answered later for a specific reason. Always remember that when you pray, your prayers are heard 100% of the time. If the answer is delayed, there's a reason for the delay. Something's blocking it. It could be blocked on your end. It could be delayed on Father's end. 
or the devil could be blocking it. You have to do some troubleshooting to see which one it is so you can understand how the spirit world operates. Verse 11 says, these things he said, and then after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus, that was interesting, wasn't it? He, he calls Lazarus our friend. Okay, so once again, Jesus and the disciples had made pit stops at Lazarus's house. They all knew him. They all liked him. And Jesus called him our friend. The Greek word philos means someone that you're fond of and that you're friendly with. The opposite of, an, um, opposite of the a Greek word ekthrosin, which, which means you're someone you're hostile to or you're, who is an enemy. Lazarus was everybody's friend. And he says, he's sleeping. But I'm going to go wake him out of sleep. And the disciples then said, the third level of confusion, well, if he's sleeping, he's probably getting better. He's getting, he's getting his rest. And it says, if he's asleep, he shall do well. That's the Greek word sozo. It means he will be delivered. The disciples' minds are kind of running amok here. Again, it's human nature for us not to like confusing situations, situations that confuse us. That bothers human beings. People don't like that. They want to understand what the heck is going on. And that's why there's this chronic confusion among the disciples. They don't understand what's happening. Verse 13 says, however, Jesus spoke about Lazarus's death. What they thought he was speaking of taking a rest and taking a nap, sleeping, okay? Koimesis is the Greek word for sleeping there. It means taking a nap. Verse 14 then says, then said Jesus to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Wow. And I'm glad for your sakes what a great story this is. Now, Jesus is glad that his best friend is dead. That's remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. Why is he glad? For the disciples' sake, not for Martha and Mary, not for Lazarus, but for his disciples. For your sakes, he says. He says, I'm glad I wasn't there. I wasn't there when he died. So that you will believe. Let us go to him. Then doubting Thomas cranks up and he says uh, to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now there goes Doubting Thomas again. Doubting Thomas was raised in a family where uh, his parents were nitpickers, the, the, the critical types. You were raised in a, in a family like that, probably. Your mother or your dad or both kind of nitpickers. You know, the glass was always half em empty syndrome. And uh, wow. Thomas grew up seeing the glass half empty, half empty. Wow. And he always kind of saw everything that way. After Jesus was resurrected, he comes through again. He says, now listen, if I, unless I see the prints in the hands and the spear hole in the side, Thomas knew that he had been crucified and he knew that after he was dead, a Roman soldier had stabbed him with a spear. He said, unless I see that, he says, I'm not going to believe, period. Well, that was Doubting Thomas. He was raised by parents who uh, criticized him all the time. And if he did some, if he did, you know, nine things right, his parents would catch the one thing he did wrong. They would focus on the 10th thing that he missed instead of the nine things he did right. And so Thomas then 
picked up that critical spirit from his parents when he was young. And then he became a person that was criticizing. He always saw kind of the negative side of things. So Thomas then says in verse 16 here, listen, uh, let's go with him so we will die with him. Wow. Doubting Thomas is running wild here. He thinks he thinks they're going to die. He doesn't have any faith. He thinks they has somebody killed Lazarus, so now they're going to kill us. Okay, well, let's just go with him and we'll all die. What a mindset. That's a mindset you're not going to develop for 2023. It's just not going to happen. You're going to stop doing that. If you had it in 2022, you're going to repent. And you're going to make major changes with your life. End of story. You're just going to do it. You're not going to see the glass half empty anymore. You're going to see it half full. Am I right? Of course I am. Verse 17. Then when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had been in the grave for four days. Okay, so now we know kind of how far away he was and how much time this took to transpire because we know back in the day, uh, Jewish tradition required the dead person to be buried within 24 hours. You had a day to have the memorial service, the funeral, or nothing, and then bury him. You had a day to do it. Okay, so by the time Jesus gets there, now you can see four days, four days had already passed by the time he got there. They had already put him in the grave. Okay? Nemean is a Greek word. It means sepulcher. They had put his body in a, an above-ground sepulcher, kind of like a cave. And verse 18 says, Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about 15 furloughs away. Okay, 15 furloughs. That was approximately two miles. So Bethany was approximately two miles. Uh, that would be northwest of uh, Jerusalem. Verse 19, And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now, what happens in Jewish society is if you uh, are well-to-do, you know, middle class, upper middle class, if you've got money, then you had a lot of mourners at your, uh, your funeral. Okay? If you were poor, the local synagogue would pay somebody to come over and mourn to come mourn for you. And in many instances, even the wealthy people, if the person was really important, they would have family legitimate mourners there, and then they would also have paid mourners. For example, in the story of Brother Jarius and his daughter who died while he was talking to Jesus, he asked her to, him to come minister to her because she was sick. Well, he died before she could get home. And by the time they got home, Jesus said, uh, listen, uh, it, it was another sleeping story. He says, hey, she's not dead. She's sleeping. Now, this is the reversal here. This story here, sleeping meant death. That story there is the opposite. And then it says, uh, everybody started laughing at, in Brother Jarius's house. The reason they started laughing was because they knew the girl was dead and they were just paid mourners. They, they didn't really care. They went from mourning to laughing all at once. And that happens a lot, doesn't it, with people. They pretend to feel a certain way, but if they get another stimulus, oh, another emotion comes out, and you realize, hey, that's how they really feel. And that's what happened here. And so Jesus gets to the house. To The mourners were there comforting them over his death. He was already in the sepulcher. They were back at the house. And then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house with the mourners. And then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now, here you go. Uh, Martha 
has got problems with Jesus, she's in essence criticizing him because he was late. And in 2023, you're going to understand and know, there's no question or doubt about it, God is never late. He never shows up late for you. It's not going to happen. He will never show up late. He's got it covered. It looks like he's late. It looks like he's not going to show. Yeah, I'll give that to you. That's happened to me thousands of times over the years. But he's never late. But Martha had a bone to pick with Jesus. If you'd have come sooner, you should have come sooner. I mean, we contacted him five days ago. We contacted you five days ago. And when they came back, they said, yes, we met Jesus and we told him about it. Well, he'll be here any minute. Well, he never showed. He didn't show up. Verse 21 says, uh, Martha said, listen, you're late. You're late. And in 2022, you and I made that mistake. Sometimes we were always kind of looking at God going, man, you're not. What are you doing? What's happening here? How can this be? What is going on? And that's when we get into big trouble. We start questioning God like he's human. And your heavenly father obviously is not a human. And that's when we get our prayers blocked. That's when our prayers get blocked, when we start questioning God and kind of kind of putting the pointing the finger at him. That never works out good, does it? Jesus says to her, your brother shall rise again. And Martha says, what? Oh, he's talking about the rapture. She says, oh, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, no, I'm not talking about the rapture. I'm not talking about the second coming. I'm talking about me. And in verse 25, Jesus uh, quotes the most powerful verse in all of the Bible. From the beginning of the Old Testament to the last verse in Revelation, from the beginning of the Apocrypha to the very end of it, from the beginning of all the ancient Jewish writings, from the beginning in the Talmud to the end of it, I'm about to read you the most powerful verse ever written in any piece of manuscript anywhere in the history of the world. Here it is, verse 25. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, <laughs> Martha? And of course, it's too much. It's too much. Jesus was a mind blower, wasn't he? Well, he blew her mind. She comes back with every everything she has. She does the best she could. She says to him, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she said this, he, she went her way. And then she called Mary, her sister, secretly from the other mourners. Secretly, she said, hey, didaskalos, the Greek word there for master is didaskalos, teacher. The teacher is come and calls for you. And that's what God's doing to you in 2023. He, he's here and he's calling for you. He's calling for you. He's calling for you to believe. And in 2023, you're going to memorize this verse. It's the greatest verse in all the Bible. John 11, verse 25. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. You're going to memorize that verse without fail this year. It's the greatest verse in all the Bible. Well, Mary comes out after that, and 
She says, Master, hey, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. <laughs> wow. And uh, once again, what was what was going on there? Oh, she was, again, disappointment. Disappointment. In 2023, you and I are going to have some disappointments, and you express them to God in a certain way that does not include criticism or doubt. It's perfectly normal as a person to have disappointments. Things can be very disappointing in ministry, in family, in finances, in whatever it is, your health. Things are disappointing sometimes. Yeah, everything is not absolutely time for a party, obviously. But you can be disappointed and not question God and not giving the why this, why that routine, because that's going to block an answer to your prayers. If you're honest with the Lord, you're doing great. Father, and I am so sorry. This is very disappointing to me. I was expecting this. I thought that, but I know you've got this thing covered. I know you've got it under control. I know this thing's going to work. See, so you can express your disappointment to God and he wants you to. He loves you. He cares about you. He's your counselor. I've been a counselor for 40 years and people come in my office and they tell me stuff they've never told anybody else. In fact, many times they said that to me. They said, I've never told anybody that story. I've heard that several hundred times over the years, believe it or not. You hear a lot of stuff in 40 years doing counseling work, don't you? <laughs> you get a lot of stuff that's, wow, not for public consumption. And then here it is again. She falls down at Jesus' feet and she says, I'm so disappointed. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. And now Jesus doesn't say anything to Mary. He sees her weeping. He sees the Jews weeping. And he groans in his spirit. Now here, here's a crucial, crucial point in the story that no one ever teaches about and no one's ever heard of. Verse 33, very unusual verse, extremely so. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the Jews weeping, he's talking about the mourners. The mourners, they're all weeping, okay? They're all weeping. Now, that Greek word for weeping there is klio. It means to wail, okay? They weren't just shedding a few tears, okay? They weren't doing that. They were wailing. I mean, boom. The Greek word to weep is the uh, cruel. The cruel means to just kind of shed a few tears quietly and silently. No, Clio is wailing out loud. I mean, loud wailing in sorrow. Okay? I don't know if you've ever been to a funeral where that has happened. I have been there. It's very painful to watch people wailing. It's emotionally damaging. But the response in this verse is mind-boggling. Embremaomai is the Greek word there for groan, to groan. And it means to snort with anger. What? Yes, Jesus, you would use that Greek word if you were describing a, a bull that caught you in his pasture and was snorting and lowering his head. That's what that word means. Jesus snorted with anger. <clears throat> like that. It said he groaned in his spirit, man. Okay. This was a Holy Ghost groan. And it says he was troubled, terasso, Greek word. It means to be agitated. You see what's happening here? Jesus is now staring at the nightmare of everything Adam did to us. Everybody dies. His friend died. And now everybody is mourning over his death. 
and he sees the work of Satan here encapsulated and he snorts like a bull. And he was agitated. Wow. He was upset. Okay. He didn't clio. He, he didn't start wailing or decruel. He didn't start weeping. He snorted like a bull. <clears throat> he said, where have you laid him? Now you can, you can hear the intensity in his voice if you understand that Greek word. And when I look at the Bible, I always pretend I'm standing there watching these people. And I like to think about what they're saying, but how they're feeling and their body language and their behavior. And here you see Jesus forcefully saying, where is he? And they said, Lord, we'll come and see. And they took him to the sepulcher. And then it says, Jesus wept. That's the Greek word, that cruel I mentioned earlier, which means to casually or silently or to yourself, just weep a few tears. Quiet weeping, not wailing. Clio. Jesus is weeping outside the grave, not because Lazarus is dead, but because he's hit with everything Adam did to us. He murdered all of us, and he's staring at the result of sin. And Jesus is weeping. The same Greek word was not used when he wept over Jerusalem later at the end of his ministry. Do you remember that? He stood on the hilltop and cried over Jew Jerusalem. That was Clio. Can you imagine that? He was wailing over Jerusalem, but here he's just weeping over Lazarus' sepulcher, seeing the result of sin, the results of humanity. That's the shortest verse in the Bible in the New Testament, verse 35 in John chapter 11. Now you can memorize that verse, and I want you to memorize it this year. Verse 35, Jesus wept. I know you can do it. And then the Jews looked at him weeping, shedding a few tears. And they said, my goodness, how much he loved him. Look at that. He must have really cared about him. Greek word phileo, he must have liked him a lot. He must have been very fond of him. They must have been good friends, is what the Jews said. See that? Verse 37 then says, uh, some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Here you go again. Now the devil pipes up with a Doubting Thomas comment. Only this time it's coming from the, the Jews who were non-believers, the mourners. Okay, I wonder, you know, if he healed all these people and even opened blind eyes, do you think he could have kept Lazarus from dying? Because he was really sick. He was in big trouble. And then more unbelief and doubt when you ask certain questions. Questions are good in life unless they're questions of doubt. And then they work very poorly with the Holy Ghost because the Bible says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. These kinds of questions quench the Spirit. Verse 38, Jesus, therefore, again, groaning, there he goes again. Embrimaomai, there it is again. He snorts like a bull. It says he's groaning in himself, not, not in public, not externally, but inside his spirit, man. He is agitated. He's upset. Watching this, people doubting him, death claiming every man. He's watching the mourners. The whole scene got to him. And he says, take away the stone. And Martha and the sister of him that was dead said to him, Lord, by this time he stinks. Adzo is the Greek word. It means he smells horrible. This dude stinks, literally stinks. He's been in there 
four days. Why four days? Yes, well, the Jews had a tradition that the spirit stayed with the body after death for three days. Then the spirit went to its eternal home with the person either in heaven or hell. But for the first three days, the spirit stayed in the sepulcher with the body. That was their tradition. It wasn't true, but that's what they believed. So Jesus deliberately waited four days for the resurrection of Lazarus so that no one could say, oh, wait a minute, no, no, three days? Yeah, he could have been resurrected because the spirit was still there. The spirit stayed with the body. No, the Holy Ghost said four days, there'll be no question that he's dead. He stinks like crazy and it's four days, the spirit has left the body. They took away the stone and then Jesus lifted up his eyes. His eyes are still down. He's still weeping. They roll the stone away from the sepulcher. Then he lifts up his eyes and he stops weeping. Then he starts praying. Check this prayer out. It's spectacular. He says, quote, Father, thank you for hearing me. I know you hear me all the time. You always hear me. You always hear me. But I'm saying this out loud because of these people standing by. Everybody's looking at him and he's talking to Father. He lifts up his eyes and he's talking to God and people are standing around <laughs> listening to him talk to Father. And he, and he says, this, this story is so great. I giggle all the way through it because it's so wonderful. And the people are standing by and he says, I said this so that they may believe you sent me. He's talking to Father about the people standing around him, not about Lazarus. And I'm saying this to you, Father, out loud right now, so these people will believe you sent me. Because that was Jesus's, his great goal was to get people to believe that Yahweh or Jehovah or Yehovah had sent him. Because if people believed that Jehovah had sent him, and there was no question he was divine. And when he had spoken that, it says he cried. Kraugadzo is a Greek word there for cried, and it means to scream. He screamed with a loud voice, a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Exo is a Greek word there. It means come outside. Hey, Lazarus, come on outside. <laughs> the reason he called Lazarus' name is so that the people outside would know who he was talking about and so that the other dead bodies in the sepulcher, because middle-class people and the poor people, they didn't get their own sepulchers. The rich people did, but poor people didn't. They, were, they would stack them in there. Had he not called for Lazarus, then all the dead people in the sepulcher would have just come walking out. You know, looked like a Kmart blue light special back in the 80s. Boom, there's people everywhere. He had to call out Lazarus so that only Lazarus would have come out. And it says, he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave cloths, face bound with a napkin. Jesus said, loose him and let him go. That's what God's saying to you today. Did you know that? Yeah, he's saying loose, loose you in 2023 and let you go. You can't lose this year. I'm telling you, it's going to be big. It's going to be really big. All right. Listen, don't ever, don't ever doubt this. When the devil comes to kick your face in, and he will come. Now he's coming this year. You can gown on him. A lot of people don't realize the devil's a very faithful person. He will definitely show up and he will screw everything up. You can trust him. Trust me on that one. He will show up. But you know, the devil's going to show up this year. Absolutely. But you know, he's going to meet a different person this year. Because you're going to meet him with uh, 
a club upside the head this year. You're not going to question God anymore. You're not going to see the glass half empty in 2023. No, that's not going to happen. You're going to kill this thing this year. There's no doubt in my mind about it. And uh, when the devil comes for you, Jesus is going to snort. <clears throat> Have you ever got so mad you just grumbled to yourself? Ugh. You didn't say anything. You're just grumbling. You're just groaning inside. Did that ever happened to you? It has me. Well, anybody who's been married knows what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. You are going to meet him this year, not on your hands and knees, beat up and full of self-pity, low self-esteem. Oh, my God, how did this happen to me again? I don't believe any of that. No, that's not going to happen. You don't get it. You're going to open the door with a club and you're going to dish it right back. 2023 is your day, year of destiny, and you're going to take the devil apart piece by piece, like plucking legs off a spider. Boop. You're going to pluck him down, and the Lord Jesus is going <clears> to <throat> go get him. Let's get him. And that's how the Holy Ghost works. There's only one person in this universe that demons truly fear, and that's the Holy Ghost. They're scared of him, literally. I've cast demons out of thousands of people over the years. I couldn't even count the numbers. And sometimes um, demons scream when they come out. Have you ever seen that? And a lot of people have seen that. You know why they're screaming? They're scared. You know, fear demons have anxiety disorders. And the, the Holy Ghost shows up and oh. I mean, they start screaming. They're scared. And that's what's going to happen this year. You're going to use a slang term. You're going to put the fear of God in the devil this year. And he's going to have to take it. 2022 was a year of torture. And you took a few beatings. That's for sure. And we had our tough times last year. That's for sure. I was right there with you. I had them too. This year, though, is victory. Yeah. Yeah, we're all going to be kind of like Robert Duvall in that apocalypse now, you know, when he, that, that maniac was out in the field there. And he said, I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Yeah, it smells like, smells like victory. Well, this year when the devil comes hunting us down, and he'll be there, trust me. You can trust him. He's faithful. He'll show up. You know what's going to happen? He's going to get a club this year. Club upside the head. You are not going to doubt. You're not going to complain. You're not going to have self-pity. You're not going to ask why, why, why. You're going to know that sometimes the prayers are delayed for a reason. There's a reason for it. You're fine with it. You're just going to hold on. You're going to be faithful. You're going to stand your ground. You're going to stand in the liberty wherein Christ has set you free. He will not become entangled again with the yoke of bondage because the prayer wasn't answered now. It wasn't answered yesterday. It's supposed to be there today. And it's not there. You're not even going to flinch. You're just going to hold on for victory. That's what you're going to do. You're going to have a really great year. Huh? Send me an email, Mike, at hardcorechristianity.com. I'll see you Friday night. The teaching service at the Arizona Deliverance Center. It will be on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash House of Healing AZ. Don't forget to order Peter Valenzuela's new book on deliverance. It's a solid read. You'll love it. 2023 is your year of total victory. You're going to kill it.